This is Dylan. Dylan is a student in Year 11 that is physically late maturing. Dylan has begun to decline academically in comparison to his early years in high school. He is no longer engaging in basketball, which he loves, and he is becoming withdrawn and involved in risk-taking behaviour. How can we help? Steinberg believes adolescents' inclination to engage in risky behaviour does not appear to be due to irrationality, delusions of invulnerability or ignorance, but rather grounded in biological development, cognitive neuroscience and social forces. Let us consider the key developmental issues Dylan is faced with. Number one, biological development. Dylan is physically late maturing, so what does this mean? He has low body fat, does not have much hair growth underneath his arms, on his face and on chest, shoulders and back. Also, Dylan has a high-pitched voice, small stature and is weaker than his early maturing cohorts. This places Dylan at risk as there is a higher likelihood that Dylan will take on deviant behaviour due to feeling unfavourable amongst his peers in association to his physical appearance. Dylan is no longer being selected for leadership roles in basketball. Jones and Musson recognise that late maturing males are more likely to reveal feelings of inadequacy, dependency and low status among peers compared to early maturing males who are seen more as leaders. Number two, cognitive development. Dylan is now engaging in risky behaviours, smoking, truanting and stealing. Steinberg believes that the gap between the early maturation of socio-emotional networks and the relatively late maturation of cognitive networks creates an imbalanced state in which emotions are likely to override cognitive control mechanisms. This makes it difficult for Dylan to impose constraints on stimulus-driven behaviours and his capacity to reason, judge and impulse control at a reasonable level. This may be due to teaching strategies employed in the classroom. The mathematics teacher may have changed their instructional techniques with the class, which could have had a negative effect on Dylan's learning by causing extraneous load. Extraneous load is unnecessary load on working memory, which is imposed on students due to teacher practices. Since Dylan was an excelling student, it may be that he is feeling bored and disengaged in class due to repetitive content and explicit methods which he may have already mastered. This is called the advanced learner effect. Number three, social development. Dylan has isolated himself from his usual friends who previously encouraged positive behaviour. Steinberg and Monaghan believe that peer approval is the primary contextual factor contributing to adolescents' heightened tendency to make risky decisions. As Dylan feels differentiated amongst his peers due to this physical appearance, this places Dylan as a potential victim of bullying and his engagement in risk-taking behaviour may be considered a way to gain peer approval and attention from his peers. Further partaking in risk-taking behaviour places Dylan at risk of affiliating with delinquent peers, causing long-term ratification towards positive educational goals and potential mental health problems. Now that we have examined Dylan's key developmental issues, let's explore potential interventions. Considering Dylan wishes to excel in his studies to receive a scholarship, it is imperative to implement interventions that the family and school could utilise to help Dylan. According to Ellis and others, he believes the psychopathology model that promotes positive and supportive environments facilitates good developmental outcomes. Happiness, security, attachment, emotional regulation and educational success. Whereas negative or stressful environments foster bad developmental outcomes. Depression, substance use and school failure. This is supported by Resnick and others who also found that family connectedness and school connectedness were protective forces against a range of health risk behaviours in adolescents. As a year advisor, the most imperative step is to ensure that Dylan stays at school and from here we will be addressing the needs of Dylan by providing support through whole school, classroom and family interventions. Number one, a whole school approach. School connectedness, which can be defined as the extent to which students feel personally accepted, respected, included and supported by others in the school social environment, has been identified as a critical protective factor in adolescent development. Children and young people with a higher level of school connectedness are less likely to engage in violence and abuse substances. In light of this, there are many strategies schools can use to increase school connectedness. 
One strategy that may be implemented in the school is social and emotional learning programs, which are believed to enhance student resilience. Example of programs include Smiling Minds and Mind Up, that foster the development of well-being traits using social, emotional and self-regulation strategies that help students build on their non-cognitive skills. More specifically, these problems could assist Dylan to better manage his behaviour, allowing him to feel a sense of belonging in his school network and hopefully increase his engagement in academic and sport achievement. Jerlak proved in his meta-analysis that students who are involved in social-emotional programs are more likely to achieve better academic results. However, the potential ramifications of implementing SEL programs into schools is the time constraints of being able to teach resilience to students in a limited amount of time. Also, programs are deemed expensive to find and require a high level of school commitment to incorporate new programs. Number two, classroom approaches. The first strategy we focused on is strength-based. The promotion of supportive relationships, opportunities to belong, Positive social norms, opportunities for skill building are all strategies teachers can implement in classroom practice to help Dylan disengage in high-risk behaviours. Dylan's passion for drama can be utilised as a way to help build up his confidence again in being able to be in being able to excel in his other subjects. The recognition of academic competency will allow Dylan to build resilience and personal achievement skills. Building on the strength-based approach, drama therapy is another method that can be implemented to assist Dylan. Due to Dylan's interest in drama, it may be an approach which encourages him to seek help in an indirect and effective manner. Drama therapy works to empower students and assist them with their daily struggles in a fun and interactive way. It uses role play and acting to allow students to develop a greater awareness of their emotions and actions in their daily lives. It has proven to be effective in schools with at-risk students to improve behaviour, school engagement and academic achievement. Some issues with regard to this approach is the lack of extensive evidence in support of drama therapy. Furthermore, it may be quite costly for a school to employ a team of drama therapists for this purpose. The second strategy is positive teacher-student relationships. An adoption of foundational strategies that focus on establishing personal relationships with and amongst students is believed to minimise risk-taking behaviour. Dalton and Watson predict that children who perceive schools and classrooms to have a strong sense of community and feel that their school and teachers care about them are more likely to like school, trust and respect their teachers, enjoy challenging learning activities and resolve conflicts fairly without force. An example could be a class meeting where students can describe ways they want the class to be and then collaborate to establish class norms and collaborative learning environments where it is safe to make mistakes and everyone has a way to participate. This method is effective because it can promote positive behaviour, give Dylan a sense of belonging and a healthy relationship with a trusted adult. An issue associated with this method may be that Dylan is reluctant to entrust a teacher with a personal relationship or even fear of being regarded as an outcast by his peers. The third strategy is improving pedagogical practices. Boa and others provides recommendations teachers could adopt to help teach gifted and talented students like Dylan, who may find current teaching strategies too boring and easy. One way the mathematics teacher could reduce extraneous load expressed by Dylan is by encouraging the student to participate in extracurricular activities that involve academic As gifted children are often natural leaders, it is important to invite them to use their talents and abilities in beneficial rather than disruptive ways. Number three, family approach, which can be achieved through the family connectedness intervention. A parent, according to Schofield and Beek, must be available, sensitive, accepting and cooperative. It is important that Dylan's parents learn how to cope with stress, communicate clear expectations, eliminate coercive parenting, and reward positive behaviour if they wish to prevent and deter Dylan from engaging in risky behaviour. Anger believes that caregivers must provide a balance between encouraging autonomy and setting limits. As a year advisor, we could advise Dylan's parents to participate in family strengthening programs that teach family management skills that have been proven to reduce peer conflict, aggression, and substance use. Examples of such programs include the Strengthening Families Program for Parents and Children and Functional Family Therapy. 
A disadvantage associated with this intervention could be a lack of cooperation from both Dylan and his parents, or even the cost of attending therapy sessions. In conclusion, a range of approaches have been proposed to assist Dylan inside and outside the classroom. Thank you.